All right, this is going to be our offertory song. Hope it's a blessing to you. It's a song called On Fire uh, by a band called Sanctus Real. And it talks about, man, it talks about that first love when you first got saved, the way God was moving in your heart, and the excitement that you had. And man, we've all, all of us, everybody seated here, everybody that's not here today, has got to be careful that things don't get in the way of that. Because life has a bad way of jumping in the middle of that, making you forget how awesome Jesus is, how gloriously you're saved, and how good it's going to be. Amen? Amen. So just this will be our offertory hymn this morning.
319. 319. while you're working your way there. And absolutely numbers. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, numbers. 
Deuteronomy all the way back, all the way back. Yes, Children's Church, K through 6, headed that way. Amen. K through 5th, whatever, well, however the school goes, K through 5th then. Amen. Amen. K through 5th. So we get to keep you now. Uh-huh, that's right. Amen. All right, Numbers chapter 13. And, and absolutely, you know what? I love that last song we did, that In the Cross. I mean, I love that song. Uh, and it's even got that reference. Number one, it's a Fanny J. Crosby song. In case you don't know who Fanny J. Crosby is, she was blind from birth. And she wrote, I mean, hundreds of these songs that we sing. And so many of them, we've got quite a few in that song book right there. But she was blind and she's talking about, you know, seeing Jesus. And, and even, even when she was asked one time about how she felt about her blindness, she said, well, it doesn't matter to me. She goes, the first face I'll ever see will be the face of my Savior. So she goes, that's working out pretty well for me and she wrote all these beautiful songs and that one in particular because you know what you are living this life you are alive right now because of the cross you are fixing to go to heaven when this is over with because of the cross you're going to enjoy the eternity that you're fixing to enjoy because of the cross because of that place where the payment of sin was made for you and that blood was shed amen and I mean, that just ought to be what we talk about all the time. You know what? Don't matter. Well, you so imperfect. Don't matter. I got the cross. Amen. The cross is covering me on that. It's overshadowing everything I do, everything I've got going on. When I'm not who I should be, when I don't act like I ought to, hey, you know what? The cross is still yet covering me. Amen. I want to tell you something. I just got to give you this. Uh, I was thinking about that, you know, because we believe absolutely, according to the scripture, in the security of the believer that once you get saved, you're saved. That's it. You know, and I had, I've had people say, well, okay, so you can just get saved and do whatever you want. Well, you know what the real answer to that is? Most of you do anyway, amen? Most of us get saved and do what we want anyway. So apparently, yes, you can, amen? I mean, just always remember that. That's the answer to that because, you know, some people act like they're so super spiritual and all they do is this, that, and the other. Most of the time, uh, we have quite a bit of that going on in our life where we're busy just doing what we want to do. You know, not really con taking into consideration uh, other things, just doing our own thing. So uh, anyway, I just want to throw a little line up there. We have our July 3rd morning service coming up in the announcements in the bulletin. I want to get these out of the way. We're going to have the Mackey Willis family here. Uh, look, uh, Brother John's going to be running the barbecue out there. And Brother John needs some hamburgers and hot dogs. Okay? Cheap stuff. Hamburgers and hot dogs. Just bring some of that and we'll work on getting some buns. You know, just whatever whatever you think of. You know, I like when God works like that. We just kind of throw things out there. You know, we're going to need some buns and we get some ketchup and mustard. And we're going to need a little potato salad to go along with some hamburgers and hot dogs. That's not that hard a chore. Amen. And I'm pretty sure that we can get together and kind of just bring those things in. Uh, not a big deal. If everybody spent a $10 bill, I'm sure we'd have more food we know what to do with. Amen. So just be thinking about that along with that. July 4th through 8th is our Dry Creek Baptist Camp uh, for the 7th through 12th graders. Uh, annual youth Bible camp. We're going to be doing some more fellowships to help uh, raise some money. It's $198 per camper this year. So I want you to be praying about that. And then July 18th through the 22nd is going to be our VBS Vacation Bible School. Uh, we're thinking about changing that to a morning time from the 9 to 12 time in the morning because it seems like our volunteers are, are available at that time. So that's been talked about and discussed. I see them looking at one another. But anyway, so she'll talk to you about that. And, and uh, we're going to take a look at that also. But anyway, got our VBS coming up. Got some people already interested in that and encouraged about that. So we are too. This evening, tonight at 6 p.m., we're going to be starting in the book of Revelation. Okay. Now I know it is, I know it's Memorial Day weekend and of course it's the first weekend of summer. And if you look around, you probably got a pretty good idea of that already. Amen. It's the first weekend of summer. Uh, I don't care. It's the first weekend of summer. I'm still going to start this Bible study in the book of Revelation. We're going to do as God leads us to do around here and everybody can catch up, get in, get on board whenever they decide they want to. Amen. So we're just going <laughs> to, amen, Miss Faye likes that. That's right. So we're going to be starting in the book of Revelation, chapter 1. So you get home this afternoon and need something to read. That will give you something to look into. Right now, though, we're going to be in Numbers, chapter 13 is where we're going to be. And I want to preach a message this morning entitled, It's All in How You See It. It's All in How You See It. And in Numbers, chapter 13, verse 1 through 3, it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou men that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel, of every tribe of their fathers shall you send a man, every one a ruler among them. And Moses, by the commandment of the Lord, sent them from the wilderness of Paran, all those men 
uh, were heads of the children of Israel. I'm going to stop there. We're going to make a little jump down to verse 17 because it lists all these guys. And if your name was in there, it would be important for you to read that. So I'm going to give you the opportunity to look at that later. But for time's sake, we're going to go down to verse 17. It says, And Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan, and said unto them, Get ye up this way southward, and go up into the, into the mountain, and see the land, what it is, and the people that dwelleth therein, whether they be strong or weak, few or many, and what the, uh, what the land is that they dwell in, whether it be good or bad, and what cities they be that they dwell in, whether in tents or in strongholds, and what the land is, whether it be fat or lean, whether there be wood therein or not, and be of good courage and bring of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the uh, time of the first ripe grapes. So they went up and searched the land from the wilderness of Zin unto Rehob as the men came to Hamath. And they, they ascended by the south and came up to Hebron where uh, Ahaman and Sheshai and Telemai, the children of Anak, were. Now Hebron was built seven years before uh, Zoan in Egypt. And they came into the brook of uh, Eshcol and cut down from thence a branch with one cluster of grapes. And they bare in between two upon a staff, or took two guys with a stick, and they brought of the pomegranates and of the figs. And the place was called the brook Eshcol because of the uh, cluster of grapes which the children of Israel cut down from there. And they returned from searching the land after 40 days. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel under the wilderness of Paran, to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. So right now you're thinking things are going to go pretty good. Amen. I mean, things are going to go pretty good. They went in there, man, they, they, they walked around, they got grapes, they got pomegranates, they got figs, they're bringing all this stuff back. I mean, it's an awesome land. God said it was going to be a land flowing with milk and honey. That's what they're seeing. Everything ought to go well. Amen. Yeah, but then you got people involved, don't you? So let's see the rest of the story. It says in verse, uh, it says, showed them the fruit of the land, verse uh, 27. And they told him and said, we came unto the land, whither thou sentest us. And surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Here comes that word, verse 28. Everybody, you need to underline this word. Nevertheless. Man, that's like saying but. It just deletes everything in front of what you just said. It, whenever you say but... Or you say, nevertheless, you're deleting everything you just said. It's like, well, you know, uh, I mean, I really think a lot of you and I, I like you a lot. But, well, as soon as you said but, you just killed the fact that you think a lot of me and like me a lot. Amen? Because now you're fixing to tell me what you really think. Okay, just always remember that. So they're like, yeah, it's a land flowing with milk and honey. Nevertheless, or but, the people be strong that dwell in the land. The cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. And the children of Anak were those of the giants. And the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. And the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. So he said, there's people everywhere. Powerful people. The sons of Anak, which are of the giants, are there. He said, their cities are walled. They're not just living in tents or little thatch hutches. They got big bricked up cities. Amen. So then little Caleb jumps in, verse 30, it says, And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. It said, But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against this people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched under the children of Israel, saying, The land uh, through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof and all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature in verse 33 this is where I want to get you this, it's all in how you see it and there we saw the giants the sons of Anak which come of the giants and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers and so were we in their sight I want to read that again and there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so were we in their sight. Let's pray this morning. Father, I just lift this text to you, Father. I ask you to draw out of it, Father, the truths you want us to see this morning, and let us realize it's all in how you see it. Uh, Father, it's all in the eyes we use. Father, we're using 
the eyes of faith or the eyes of the flesh is going to determine how we view the situations and circumstances around us. So, Father, I just ask for your anointing and your empowering, Lord, and that you take this people. Father, the only reason I'm preaching this morning is at your command to encourage this people. And if there's any here that are lost, that they would get saved. Apart from that, there's no purpose, no end to it. But, Father, I know you're going to take these things and you're going to build these people up and you're going to teach them to look the right way so that they can see things clearly and understand understand what you're trying to give them. Father, I truly believe this can be a life-changing message for anybody listening this morning because indeed it is all in how we see it. Anoint and have your willing way now in Jesus' name. Amen. It's all in how you see it. When they get down to the end of it, that's what they wrap it up to. That this is what we saw and there we saw. And they start talking. They have described and gone over all the problems, all the difficulties, all the bad things, all the situations, all the scenarios of why they can't possess what God says for them to possess. That ought to be already working on you in your spirit, amen? Because that's something that we have a great tendency to do. We already start to look about why we can't do this and why we can't do that and how come I'm in this situation and how come I'm in that scenario and how come my life's turned out such and such and all these things and immediately begin looking at those things and we're seeing it the wrong way. Now, I'm gonna tell you something. It was weird to me, so I'm gonna share this with you. The little three-letter word C has about a half a dozen meanings to it. Did you know that? Little three-letter word C has about a half a dozen meanings to it. I'll give you some of them. Uh, you can be seeing someone. You can see somebody out. You can see somebody's bet. You can just see something. And then you can use the term C for what we're going to use today because this is what, what the scripture is talking about. You can see which means to uh, understand or comprehend, amen? Then you go, oh, I see. That means you've understood and comprehended something. That little word see has so many different variables about it, and I think it's important to know what we're talking about, amen? So the whole point is we're going by what these guys saw. The, the Bible tells us that Moses sent 12 spies. This is where they first come out of Egypt. The children of Israel have been brought out of Egypt. This is their first run. They're right up there next to where God has for them to go. It's been a pretty short period of time. God's ready to move them into the land. He says, Moses, you pull out 12 spies. You send them in there and you let them look around and come back and give a report. See if it's not how I said it was. See if it's not flowing with milk and honey. See if it's not the good land that I promised you. So they go in, they come back with all that stuff, with the grapes, with the figs, with the pomegranates. They're talking about how it flowed with milk and honey. And then 10 of the spies, as opposed to two, 10 of them band together and start talking about all the problems and all the difficulties and how bad the situation is. And you got two left that tell it different. Joshua and Caleb. Now what is going on here? Why is this taking place? I want you to take a look for, uh, at something with me. Matthew chapter 6 real quick. First book of the New Testament. Not hard to get to. Matthew chapter 6. And I want you to see something that Jesus said. And we're going to take that and kind of uh, entwine it into this, uh, what we're doing here this morning. Matthew chapter 6, verse 22 and 23. Matthew 6, 22 and 23. The Bible says, the light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single or healthy, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil... The whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? So he's talking about the fact, it's the term we use, that the eyes are the windows to the soul. Amen? That through what we see, what we perceive, and what we understand, we're impacted within ourselves. Amen? Okay? Now he says, if, if, you're, if the light of the body is the eye and your eye is single, your eye is healthy, you are looking in a good manner then your body is going to be full of good things. If you see it good, 
you're going to feel it good. Amen? Are you getting that? If you see it good, you're going to feel it good. You're going to receive it good. And you're going to understand the hope and prospects that, it, that, that, that are there. But he said, if your eye is evil, your whole body is going to be full of darkness. Now listen, you know and I know some people that everything that's ever happened in their life was evil. Amen? It's one bad scenario, one bad situation, one heartbreak, one shortcoming, one failing, one falling after another over and over and over again. Well, their perception of all that evil evil is making them what full of darkness amen anybody amen me anybody know somebody like that you know gloom despair and misery on me it's just bad 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 well you know what as long as you think that way as long as you perceive things that way as long as you see it that way you know what it's going to be that way now, am I saying you can just change everything by the way you look at it? Not exactly. Just stay with me. We had these ten spies that go into the land back in our text. And they're looking around. And they see all the good stuff. They see all the good stuff like, like the other two did. I want you to understand. We're dividing into ten and two, okay? Like you're driving the car, amen? Ten and two. I think they don't even say do that anymore. Whatever. Used to be ten and two. So I just want to get that thought in your head. So it's ten against two. Well, these ten saw the same thing the other two saw. They helped carry the grapes back. They saw the pomegranates. They saw the fruit. They saw the timber. They saw the animals. They saw the beauty of it. They saw the rivers. They saw everything else, but they never once mentioned it when they got before the rest of the people. All they could see and all they perceived were the difficulties involved. Whatever you do, quit being that person, okay? Quit being that person. Quit only looking at the difficulties. Quit only looking at the problems. Quit only looking at the shortcomings. And start looking at the blessings that can be had. See, the whole point is, it's about our sight. Let me ask something. What's influencing your sight today? What's influencing your sight today? In Ephesians chapter 5 verse 18... Bible tells us not to be drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Okay? Now, everybody would agree that alcohol, uh, that alcohol impacts your vision, correct? It changes how you see things. And I mean, changes how you see it physically, changes how you see it mentally, changes how you see it emotionally. You know, you get that old boy that just cries every time he gets drunk, amen? Just all of a sudden, he just, everything's bad, and nobody, mama left me, and blah, 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 and they just cries the whole time, amen? Because everything just gets changed, and he sees things differently. You know, everybody knows, everybody knows the, the, the concept and the idea that she was really pretty last night, amen? He was really handsome last night. And I sobered up this morning, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, what a... What I got myself into, amen? I mean, alcohol influences the way you see things. Listen, now listen, God uses that. He's using that right there. He says, be not drunk with wine. Now, he's using that. God's not playing around with us. He knows we're real people, real human beings. And he's using something that he knows we can equate ourselves to. He says, so don't be drunk with wine. Don't be influenced by wine in that perception. He's trying to give you a, a picture of that. He says, but rather be influenced. Be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And then it's the same way, like alcohol makes you th see things differently. If you're under the influence of the Holy Spirit, you're going to start seeing things differently. So now the question is this this morning. Are you looking at stuff with old eyes? Or are you looking at stuff with new eyes? Old eyes are the way you always saw stuff. And you respond the same way, and you say the same things, and you act the same way, and you view things the same as you ever did? Or are you filled with the Spirit and using new eyes to see things differently? To see it in a new manner, in a new way, in a new light? Huh? See, those ten were using their old eyes. Let's see what happened. Number one, when you use your old eyes, you exalt the enemy. When you use your old eyes to perceive and see around you, you begin to exalt the enemy. All they could talk about was how big and how strong the enemy was. 
It's all they can say. There's the Malachites. There's the sons of Anak. There's giants. They're, they're huge. They're enormous. We're like grasshoppers in front of them. All they could do was exalt the enemy. Some of us, some people, I'll put it that way, don't get over what's in their life because they've exalted it to such a level that they just cannot see the possibility of there being any victory. But there's no way, man. This addiction is too big. It's been around too long. It's too strong. I've been this way my whole life. I've got too much hurt in me. Amen? I've got too many problems, too many issues, too many things. I'm in such a hole. I don't see where I'll ever give out. Do you understand? You're not seeing with your new eyes. You're seeing with your old eyes. Amen? And you are exalting the enemy. You are exalting the problem. You are exalting. Some of you are dealing with things now in your present that Satan put in your past that haven't run their course yet. Amen? That's the simple truth. He put it in there, hadn't run its course yet, hadn't finished up. What I'm telling you is look at that right with your new eyes and understand that, you know what? One day this is going to end. It's going to run out, peter out, be done with, go away, and I'll be moving a different direction. But right now I'm not going to use my old eyes and let everything continue to be discombobulated in a big mess and exalt that. But I'm going to look at it right. Amen? That's right. Amen. Because I'm telling you, we get to looking with our old eyes, we get to exalting the enemy. All that has happened, all that's taken place, all where I've ended up, all where I'm at. And then you know what else we do? We minimalize ourselves. We minimalize ourselves. Listen to me this morning. You are the sons and daughters of God. Amen? If you are a believer in Christ, you are a son or daughter of the creator God of the universe, the cataclysmic thunder and lightning and smoke and ability beyond our comprehension. You are his sons and daughters. That makes you something. Amen. You didn't make you something, but he has made you something. But here these are, these warriors of God. Amen. And you're going, it's they, just too big. And we little grasshoppers all we are. I can't do it. I'm not strong enough. I'm not able enough. Oh, I'll tell you what. Especially, especially young men. Mm, just now, look, any, any of the older guys in here, that just makes you want to backhand somebody, amen? To hear a man, a man of any age talk like that is just more than I can stomach, okay? That little just, just well, no, I just, I'm just not strong enough. I mean, yes, you are. Put your boots on and get up and go to work like everybody else does. Amen? Huh? Do what needs to be done. Take it. Carry the load. You're not unusual. You're not special. And you're not, you're, you're not uh, set apart some way. You know what? Just do what everybody else does. Amen? Quit minimalizing yourself that I'm too broken, unable, and not, not capable of doing what everybody else does. Amen? Same thing, we continue to minimalize ourselves when we look with old eyes. I've always been this way. I'm just too weak. I'm just not powerful enough. I'm just not, I don't have enough faith. Amen? You got enough faith to get you to heaven, but you don't have enough faith to get you out the door? That's confusing. Amen? Seems like the bigger one's getting to heaven. Amen? You know, don't minimalize yourself. Ladies, listen to me. It's coming up summertime. Amen? Don't minimize yourself. Don't buy into the whole world idea and world process that the only value you have is how you look outwardly to everybody around you. Amen? Make sure you keep yourself decent. Make sure you keep yourself modest. Make sure you keep yourself covered. I mean, you ain't got to wear, you know, a big robe or something like that. Although those Middle Eastern ladies pull that off. I don't know how. Amen? Just think about they out in the desert and they're just covered from head to toe. Amen? I mean, all they're doing is peeking out. Huh? I mean, I, you know, so, you know, I'm, what I'm saying is, you know, wear something appropriate, comfortable, cool. I know we're in South Louisiana, but God didn't call, didn't, didn't put in any orders for no Daisy Dukes or nothing like that. Amen. Try to keep everything well packaged and well managed. Amen. And I'll tell you this too. I'm going to be very honest with you. I mean, I like my sleeveless t-shirts, but I don't go to town in them. Amen. You might catch me around the house. You know, I might even get out and mow the yard like that. But, you know, as your pastor, I ain't going to town like that with all my tattoos hanging out and just, you know, it just don't, no, it just ain't going to happen. Amen. You know, I can take the time to put on something a little bit better than that to get myself to the grocery store in. Sometimes it's irritating. Amen. I mean, I am. I get my, my little, my little, you know, my little khaki looking shorts and my sleeveless shirt and I got my flip flops on and I need something from the grocery store and I got to go in and change before I go to town because I'm not going like that. Amen. That's okay. 
Nothing wrong with that stuff. We are the sons and daughters of God, and we ought to present something. You know, somewhere we've lost that. We, we, we got so over to the one side trying to fit in with the world and make the world comfortable around us that we lost sight of the fact that we're the sons and God, daughters of God, and we ought to be representing something. You know what? Ought to be, yeah, I used to dress like that, but I don't know more. I used to think that my only value was in what others thought of me and whether I could attract them or whether they were, you know, they were attracted to me or whatever the situation was, but not anymore, amen. I know that my value is in Jesus Christ and what he's done in my life and that I am worth something to God and that means more than if I was worth something to every, every male or every female on this planet. doesn't make any difference to me anymore because I am his, I'm one of his sons and daughters and I'm going to conduct myself in a manner that brings honor and glory to him. Amen. But they minimalized themselves. They were overwhelmed. They exalted the enemy. They minimalized themselves. And they lost their perception of God. Huh? They lost their perception of God. In Numbers 14, in verse 3, they said, And wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? They lost their perception of God. They're saying God brought us here to kill us so that our wives could be taken away and our children could be put to slavery. Man, they lost their perception of God. God hasn't brought you anywhere to see you defeated. Amen? God hasn't brought you anywhere to see you fail. Whatever you are going through, whatever you are confronted with, whatever you are dealing with, whatever the challenges are, don't you ever believe that God's not got a hand in it and didn't bring you there on purpose and he brought you there to win. Amen? To have victory over that situation, over that circumstance, over whatever's been troubling you. He didn't bring you there so you could die. See, when we look with our new eyes, we understand that all things are working together for good for those that love God and are the called according to His purpose. Whatever you've been through so far in your life, God put into you so that somewhere down the line, you could use that for somebody else. Amen? He's taking that mess and making a message out of it. He's taking that trial and making a triumph out of it. He's taking those tests and making a testimony out of it. He's trying to use you to accomplish and be something when you move forward. Amen? Thank you. Amen. My clappers, man. I got on to them. I said, they went down there and clapped for Bill Britt. I said, you be I said, if I say anything even close to good, you better clap for me. Amen. Can't clap for your own pastor. Go clap for somebody else. I ain't having that. Whew. Well, I'm telling you now, listen this morning. Their perception of God just disappeared. This is the same God that parted the Red Sea for them. Same God that sent manna from heaven for them. Same God that supplied water for the rock, from the rock for them. Same God that's been taking care of them up to this point. And they get to this place and they said, God brought us here to kill us. Huh? You know what? Every one of us in here, the reason you're laughing is because you like that. Well, I just ain't going to get by this one. Yes, you are. You're still at 100% in bad days because there you are. Amen. God's brought you through every bit of it and there you sit. And he continually does that over and over and over and over again. And we continue to act like he's not going to this time. Amen? Like somewhere he's just going to run out and just say, nope, on your own. Just leave you to it. He's not. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Going to take you through. Going to make sure you're okay. Do not allow your perception of God to get messed up because you're looking at situations and circumstances with your old eyes. Your old eyes of the flesh. And well, you know what? And one of the biggest things that Satan likes to drag up one of the biggest things he likes to say, it ain't never going to change. It's just like it's ever been. You're going to church and it's still issues and problems. Well, you know what? Yeah, you're going to church and there's still issues and problems. You know what? I go to church and there's still issues and problems. Amen? Okay, everybody say amen, right? Still issues and problems. Amen? But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be able to confront them and deal with them in such much better fashion and with so much more grace and integrity and poise because of the anointing of the Holy Spirit and because of God working in my life and because I can see it properly and know that He's working in my life and working in the life of those around me and that eventually He's going to bring that out and maybe He has to wring it out and it takes some time and it seems too slow to me and I'm thinking it's never going to pass and it's never going to stop but eventually you're going to run out of water someday. Amen. You finally squeeze that thing hard enough to where it's just dry and nothing else comes out and that's the day that everything changes and you know what I want to get to that day amen 
That's right. My perception is not going to be altered by these situations. Their perception of God, God was gone. And this one here just gets my heart. These ten, looking with their old eyes, then impacted others. Look in Numbers 14, verse 1. They get done telling them how big the giants are. They get done telling them that they were grasshoppers in their sight. They get done telling them that the, uh, the, those in the land are too strong for us. We're not able to go up against this people. They get to telling them about the walled cities. They get to tell them there's people in the north and people in the south and people in the east and people in the west. Man, it ain't no good. We ain't going to get it done. Verse 14, or chapter 14, verse 1, it says, And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And the people wept that night. They cried all night long. They were brokenhearted because of the impact that those 10 had on others. What impact are we having on people? I don't want to be discouraging people. I want to show them there's a God that can change things, amen? There's a God that can do things. A God that can give you victory. A God that can bring you through. A God that can overcome whatever you're dealing with. That man, my life has been so broken, beat up, and ridiculous, but God's brought me through and actually made me into something, amen? Actually made me useful. It actually made me beneficial. One day he's going to grab me up, like I said, by that neck like you would a kitten and say, look what I did with this one. And all of heaven is going to go, wow, that's pretty phenomenal because that was a mess you started with. Amen? I mean, I want to be able to have that kind of testimony and show people that and I come in there saying, oh, well, I, I know, man, it's really bad. You ought to leave your husband. You ought to leave your wife. You ought to just quit. You ought to just give up. You just ought to do what the world says and just start all over again. Scrap it all. Throw it away along with everything else we throw away nowadays. No, man, I want to be able to stand up and impact, impact people around me for that which is good, for that which is right, that God will get you through these things. He'll make a difference. He'll make a change and it'll be okay because look you can impact others in such a negative fashion god forbid i ever impact somebody negatively and make them think less of who god is amen these did they had the whole congregation wrapped up that means all those all those that's like six hundred thousand to a million people and they've infected them with the idea that they'd kill every one of us and listen, it said in verse 2, And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, and the whole congregation said unto them, Would to God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would to God that we had died in this wilderness? They said they were so discouraged and so beat down by this report, they said it had been better if we died before we ever got here. You know, that's that, man, that's that, 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 that old, be better if I just wasn't, hadn't been born, amen? Just been better if I hadn't been born. They had impacted them negatively. What, do the old, what does looking with your old eyes do? It exalts the enemy, minimizes yourself, messes up your perception of God, it impacts others, and then it kept them from their promise. This was their promise. This was their promised land. This was their place of milk and honey. Amen? This is where the good stuff was coming from. This is crossing that river into the good stuff. Amen? Who wants to get to the good stuff? Huh? Who wants to get to that place of victory, that place of milk and honey where everything's good? Man, I'll tell you what, if you're looking with your old eyes, you're going to miss it. Because this kept them from going in. Everybody balked. Everybody held up right there. Do you know what happened to these people? God sent them back out into the wilderness for 40 years. Yeah. He said, everybody 20 and older is going to die before I bring you back around here and give you another shot at this. What? Man, I'm telling you, kept them from the promise. Look in verse 20 through 23 in Numbers 14. 20 through 23, it says, And the Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy word, but as truly as I live... All the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord because all these men which have seen my glory and my miracles which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and have tempted me now these ten times and have not hearkened to my voice, surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoked me see it. And he goes on in verse 28. 
saying to them, as truly as I live, saith the Lord, as you have spoken in mine ear, so will I to you. Your carcass shall fall in this wilderness, and all that were numbered of you according to your whole number, from twenty years old and upward, which have murmured against me. Doubtless you shall not come into the land that I swear concerning with, I swear to you that dwell therein, save Caleb the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua the son of Nun. Now the two get a pass, amen? Two get a pass. Everybody else, he said, you ain't going in there. Look in verse 34, he says in, in Numbers 14, After the number of the days in which you search the land, even 40 days, each day for a year you shall bear your iniquities, even 40 years, and you shall know the breach of promise. You shall know my breach of promise. He said, for every day, you are 40 days in that land looking around. He said, I'm going to give you a year for every day. 40 years back in the wilderness. Ouch. Amen. Everybody say, ouch. Ouch. You know, what's, you know what concerns me when I read that? God brings me to a place of victory and situation in my life, and I balk at it. How long before he bring me back around to do it again? Huh? We well, he just do it every day, amen? Right, just whenever I ask him, he'll just do it. Now, he brought them specifically to a place of promise, a place where victory was going to set in. And they balked at it, and they bought themselves 40 years of wandering the wilderness till he'd even bring them back again. I'm telling you what, we need to think this thing out. You know, God brings you to a place of victory, a place where you can step in and get some, uh, get some overcoming going on. You better go ahead and step in because God said, oh, you don't want to? Okay, well, since you don't want to, we'll go this way for about 20 years, and then we'll, maybe we'll bring you back around. But you're going to languish underneath the burden of that that you can't get rid of all that time until we finally get back to that place where I give you another shot at this. Amen? See, we keep thinking we in charge, don't we, Kobe? We think we in charge. We just call God in, call him down, bring him on over, just move him at our will and make everything work out. God's like, no, no, you got this all backwards. I'm the one running this show. And when I bring you to a spot of salvation, of surrender, of submission, some place of victory, and I pressure you, pull you, talk to you, incline you to move, you better move then. Amen? Because I'll take it back and it'll be another 10 years, another 15 years, another 20 years before I open that door again. Amen? That's what he did to them. He said, you bought yourself a year for every day. Ouch. That's all I can think about that is ouch. Kept them from the promise and incurred, in, in, incurred God's displeasure. Now see, we think just missing out is punishment enough. Amen? And then you didn't get to go in the promised land. That sounds like punishment enough. But God, God didn't stop there. He said, you bought you a day or a year for every day. And then on top of that, look, verse 10, and 12, uh, 10 through 12. It starts out, and I'm going to come back to this in just a second. But we're going to start out. We're going to skip that part that says all the congregation bade them stone them with stones. It said, but in verse 10, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me? And how long will it be ere they believe me for all the signs which I have showed among them? He said, I've showed them all this stuff. They still won't listen to them. He said, I will smite them with the pestilence and disinherit them and will make of thee a greater nation and mightier than they. This is the second time God's offered this option to Moses. He said, I'll kill every last one of them. He said, I'll give, he said they don't want me. After I brought them out of the land of Egypt, after I took care of them, after I watched over them, after I supplied for them, and they're going to provoke me like this when I brought them to that place of promise, and they determined they're going to walk their own way instead, he said, I'll kill every one of them. Now, don't misunderstand anything here. If he'd killed every one of them, they'd all ended up in Abraham's bosom. Okay? Or they'd all ended up in paradise. Because heaven wasn't accessed yet because Christ hadn't paid for the uh, atonement with his blood yet. They'd all, end up, they'd all have died saved. Amen? Amen? But they'd have never got here what God had for them to receive. See, if you can't play right out in the yard, God will bring you inside. Amen? You get that? You can't play right out in the yard. God will bring you to the house. And that's what he's talking about there. He said, I'll get rid of them. He said, I'll make my testimony through you, Moses, and we'll do this thing different. 
They have incurred God's displeasure. You know what? When we don't exercise faith, the Bible says in Hebrews eleven six 6, that without faith it's impossible to please God. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. When he takes us to a place, brings us to a situation, deals with us in our hearts and in our lives about something, and we refuse and we walk away, not only do we miss out on that blessing, the Bible is showing us here that we can also incur God's displeasure. In other words, you know what? Your heavenly father can get angry with you. That's something we don't talk about anymore. We don't preach about that. Amen? Now let me ask you something. Your earthly father, you know, was supposed to love you. I trust he did. But you know what? He'd get angry with you too. Amen? He might have been feeding you. He might have been taking care of you. Doesn't mean you're going to get cut off and kicked out in the street. Amen? Huh? Oh, that's right. You might get angry with your children, but that doesn't mean you quit feeding them. Quit clothing them. Whatever you don't just like, that's it. I'm mad at you. You're out. And just throw them out on the highway. Amen? But the whole point is there's still disciplines and ramifications and you have an anger about you against them because of something they have done or something they've gotten into, whatever it might be. Well, God's saying the same thing here with this situation, that there are times when God can get angry with us because of our lack of faith in him. And that's the time that God gets angry. Do you understand that? That's it. He gets angry when we lack faith in him. And we're not receiving what we could have had. You think he didn't get angry. Let's take a look at, uh, what is it? 36 and 37 of Numbers 14. And the men which Moses sent to search the land who returned and made all the congregation to murmur against him. That's the 10. By bringing up a slander upon the land even those men that did bring up the evil report upon the land died by the plague before the Lord. God took them out right in front of everybody. Huh? Hey Amen. That'll get your attention. Huh? God went to dropping unbelievers in the church. All come together in a congregation, unbelievers, you know. Those that are saved but just don't believe God do anything. Amen. We got to do it ourselves. We got to this, that, and the other about it. We got to uh, blah, blah, whatever, and we don't know, and we're not sure. And God's like, I'm tired of listening to you. Boom. Hit you with the plague and kill you in front of everybody. That might grab somebody's attention. Amen. 